Now in the frontal plane, if Craig, if you just face this way and Craig reaches his right hand down his right leg, what we want to see here is we want to see rib cage depression, we want to see rib cage elevation here. Okay, so again, if Craig's got any discomfort around his low back, then we know that there's probably something either not depressing on his right rib cage. So as Craig reaches down, his right rib cage depresses, his right diaphragm lengthens. As Craig's left uh, rib cage elevates, his left sided diaphragm is going to shorten. Okay, so that's in the frontal plane. Okay, now a big clue here as well as Craig reaches his right hand down his right leg is we want to see this hip travel. Okay, so again, we want to manage our basis support here where our center of gravity sits in between our basis support. Okay, so a lot of patients, if they don't load this right hip, okay, or they're not, you know, you, you think you've got a, a weak glute med, for instance, it's very, very wor uh, worthwhile assessing is it a really uh, a glute med issue or is it just that the rib cage and the pelvic floor aren't allowing the glute med to react efficiently? Okay, and again, there's a nice paper from, I um, can't remember the lead author, Peter Sullivan's involved in it. I'll put it in the, the, um, the reference list looking at the torso uh, movements and the reaction. So in that paper, they show that when we reach this way, you get a reaction subconsciously at the glute medius. Okay, so the glute medius reacts when the torso goes that way. And that makes sense because again, when I'm reaching down this way, I want my glute medius to decelerate my body weight as I keep my center of gravity between my base of support. Okay, so it's very, very important for that rib cage mobility. Said another way, it's very important for the, rib, the diaphragm to lengthen in order to allow us to access the opposite glute med. Okay, so again, this is where now we're starting to look at the whole body and starting to see, is it really a weak glute med? Is it a tight QL? Okay, or is it just that the diaphragm on the opposite side can't lengthen in the frontal plane? or that the rib cage can elevate here because of an accessory muscle maybe doing too much work. So again, these are just questions that are going through my mind. The last one is rotation. Craig, if you just uh, twist over your right side, look over your right shoulder. That's it, we're looking to see what's happening here. Now, the rotation, there's not a whole lot of, um, of depression and um, elevation. When I twist my right, my external obliques um, on the left side are going to push my rib cage forward. I'll need a little bit of retraction with my left or my right internal oblique. So I'll say that again. So when I twist to the right, my right external or my left external obliques, apologies, are going to work to push my ribs this way. My left internal obliques are going to work to retract my rib cage this way. So for me to be able to get onto my right heel, I work with a lot of professional golfers. The backswing, in order to get onto the heel here, they need an internal oblique that can retract my um, rib cage. Okay, that retraction of the rib cage is going to sync up with a posterior tilt of the anonymous, okay, which is going to help me access my heel here. Okay, so again, that person trying to get into this, we want to see, can they manage their basis support? Can they lower their heel while keeping a big toe on the floor? Again, we need to look from the big toe all the way up the body if the person can't do that. So I can't just say that it's because of the diaphragm and pelvic floor alone. We have to look at the person's story in the subjective assessment and make sense of those um, uh, symptoms or, or their actual previous injuries. So you can just face the camera again, Craig, just so you're not looking at the wall. <laughs> so. A lot to take in there if it's your first time of looking at the body like this. The one thing I would say is, it's just a case of understanding anatomy. It's a case of understanding physiology. What tissues are lengthening, what tissues are shortening, concentrically, centrically, whatever you want to call it. Rib cage elevating, rib cage depressing, rib cage protraction, rib cage retraction, reactions at the pelvis. And the big thing I want to finish on here is that there is a lot more to it. Just like when I wrote it this way, my ATFL has to lengthen down below, okay? So my rib cage mightn't be reacting here because maybe my brain is protecting an old ATFL injury there, okay? I see that a lot clinically from clinical experience, okay? And again, the literature is starting to come out now when we look at how we um, react to previous injuries we naturally tend to avoid loading um, some of these areas, okay? And when the pain or the noxious stimulus goes, the movement strategy that we had prior to the pain, it doesn't always return, okay? So that's our job to find what's not returned and give it back. So as I said, we in the mentorship look at the whole body here, not just the ribcage and pelvic floor, but for the case of this um, short course, 
we just want to focus on what's happening at the diaphragm and what's happening at the pelvic floor. So the first thing we want to do is the rib cage mobility. Okay, so what we what I like to do with the patient is I'll put my hands on the inferior borders, and straight away we can kind of see here that um, uh, Craig's if I'd process is a little bit high here. Okay, so again, a lot of patients when their legs are straight, you'll see that their back will arch a little bit. Now, when I get Craig to bend both knees, so if you bend both knees, Craig, we're going to uh, posterior pelvic tilt his pelvis a little bit, which is going to help his diaphragm to press a little bit. So when I press down on uh, Craig's rib cage here with his knees bent, I'm going to have less range of motion to go through. If I straighten um, Craig's knees again, now we're starting at a slightly elevated rib cage position, so I'll have a little bit more range of motion and it'll feel probably a little bit stiffer at end range. Okay, so that's very, very important to understand the difference between the knees bent and the knees straight. Okay, for the first um, assessment, I usually like to do with uh, knees bent, especially if you've got a persistent back pain patient, they may not like this position. Okay, so you can bend your knees, Craig. Now I'm gonna pop my hands down his, his lower borders. Okay, so my index fingers along his lower borders of his rib cage. And then what I'm going to get Craig to do first is just take a breath in and out, and my hands are just going to follow his, his rib cage. So as he's breathing in now, I'm, I'm feeling for what's happening. He's got a lot of elevation. And then as he exhales, good stuff. I'm feeling a lot of uh, depression, which is good, okay? I'm not feeling as much retraction, which is, is down, okay? And that's kind of what I saw in the, um, in the toe touches, there wasn't a whole lot of attraction, but there was a lot of depression, okay? So again, a lot of these people, when we elevate, we get a lot of um, protraction of the rib cage as the diaphragm shortens. As we exhale, we want depression, but retraction as well.